The absence of light, the loss of direction, no frame of reference, the presence of fear and uncertainty, void, and then a light. It starts as a flicker. It's not glaring for all to see, but it's a light nonetheless. Beautiful and mysterious, helping us to see, guiding us, warming us, comforting us. It is growing. It is shining brighter now. In one timeless moment, something of heaven is birthed through the tears of a teenage girl and the cry of a newborn baby king. All of heaven is perched at the edge of the sky, watching, waiting. God is sending the light of heaven into the dark of this world. To the young. To the old. To the weak. To the strong. To the lost. To the found. He is coming to us. He is walking with us. He is dying for us. He is living in us. 
our unthinkable darkness is being shattered by unbearable light. And we gather to see, to view with fresh eyes again, the light that all the darkness in the world cannot ever extinguish. Jesus is the light of the world. Hello, church family from home. This is the Sunday after Thanksgiving. I hope that you had a wonderful experience with family, that you found God to be a blessing in your life, and that you were thankful for all the big and small blessings in your life. Today, we are going to have a service talking about Advent, about the anticipation of Jesus Christ's celebration of his birth on Christmas Day. And so I welcome you to the Lord's house. I'm so sorry that we're not together because of the COVID pandemic and the high numbers, but we will still celebrate. God is in your house and God is here with me in your sanctuary. And so we will worship the Lord together with hymns and with singing and with scripture and with sermon. And so may the Lord bless and keep you on this day, the Sunday morning, the 29th, of November. God bless you. Good morning. I want to continue to remind you to check your email and the church website for any announcements as to what is going on with the church. The church is currently closed at this time. However, um, please follow the, the website to know what is going on. We continue to have our services online on YouTube and Facebook. I want to remind you that we continue to have a Bible study on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock in the chapel. Well, actually, it's, it's online now. Um, we're doing the book Unshakable Hope by Max Lucado, and that's led by Pastor Bob. We also will be starting another Bible study on, um, in, in January, and that study is going to be led by Tom Edwards. We're going to be studying the Epistles and the Prophets, and that, that study at this point in time will be via Zoom. And I, we ask you to please fill out the survey online. There's a survey online that is going to be going on until the 1st of December. And it's just to get an idea of what your needs are as far as that, that um, study is. And then close to the 11th of January, we'll, we will start the class. Treasure sale is on hold until further notice, so please hold on to your items at this time as well. Uh, the church will not be open to accept those, and we will let you know when that is changing. The youth group can be viewed on Zoom, and um, I would encourage any youth, um, both middle school and high school, to participate in that. We have a wonderful youth pastor, and he does such a good job, so I encourage you to participate in that. Call Jane Lankford if you're wanting to donate to any closed line project, projects. Um, at this point in time, she would know if there are any needs in the school, and she can help you to guide you through that. Fannie Mae candy bars are on sale by the UMW, and that's to support the PADS program, the homeless shelter. And you can contact Tina Geyer to purchase those, and they cost $2. We're updating the church directory, so contact Autumn by phone or email, but only if there is a change in your contact information from the last directory. And Children's Church has gone back to virtual, so I would encourage you to get online and to participate in that. Birth dates for this week. The 30th, we have Lucas Cursidlo, Dwayne Miller, and Phil Miller. The 1st of December is Pat Kessler. The 2nd, Jim Weiss. The 3rd, Rudy Netzer. The 5th, Don Bogger, Terry Dragos, and Shirley Morris. And anniversaries, we have one. And that is on December 4th, John and Beverly McGing. 
So happy birthday and happy anniversary. Thank you. My name is Emily Jackson, and these are my children, Griffin, Grant, and Cecilia. And we're going to do the Advent reading for the first Sunday in Advent. The first purple candle of Advent symbolizes hope. It is sometimes called the prophecy candle, especially Isaiah, who foretold the coming birth of Jesus Christ. Scripture reading is from Micah, verse 5. Two, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The birth of Jesus was foretold by three different Old Testament prophets. Micah, Isaiah, and Joel all predicted the birth of the baby Jesus hundreds of years before his birth in Bethlehem. God knew the perfect timing to bring Jesus to be born. God also knows the perfect timing of your birth and life. Each of us are God's children, and the Lord loves us very much. Advent means to wait and hope for his coming. We look forward to all the joy and happiness of the Christmas season, but most of all, we hope for God's presence to surround us on Christmas Eve as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Griffin is going to read the closing prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to hope and anticipate the coming celebration that awaits us with the birthday of our Savior, Jesus Christ. May this Christmas season be full of blessings and cheer. Amen.
Good morning, friends. I hope you are doing well and that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, no matter how you spent it. But now that that holiday's over, there's another one quickly approaching us. And I'm sure you guessed it, Christmas. And sometimes we get so caught up in Christmas and buying gifts and getting everything just perfect and all that hustle and bustle. But you know what? There's a few gifts that you can't buy, that we have been given by God and are pretty lucky to have given the first, our eyes. God has given us our eyes not to judge others, but to look beyond the situation they might be in or might be dealing with. God has given us our mouth not to criticize, but to speak the truth and to share his word with others. God has given us our hands, not to punish, but to give a helping hand, um, to help others, especially in their time of need. God has given us ears, not to be insensitive, but to listen and aid those in pain. And right now, there's a lot of individuals that are kind of suffering. Um, given the current situation with COVID and I think there's a lot in pain that just need that ear to listen to. But most importantly, everything God gave us has its purpose. So use them for the greater glory of the Lord. So don't get caught up in the hustle and bustle, but remember those things that God has given us and how he would like us to use those. Join me in a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for blessing us with these gifts and reminding us not to get caught up in the hustle and bustle, but to use these gifts that you've blessed us with to help others in their time of need and to comfort them with these blessings you've given us. Amen. Take care. Bye. What's up, Awakening Youth? I hope that you're doing well today. Today, I would like to talk about the topic of anxiety. And with so much shifting and changing and moving around us, sometimes it's, it's so easy for us to fall into this overwhelming sense of worry and allow the world to become a burden that God never actually created for us to carry. So I wanna, I wanna look at the scripture right here, the teaching of Jesus about this topic of anxiety. In Matthew chapter six, Jesus says this, and if God cares so wonderfully for wild flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So we see this promise here. Jesus is telling us, don't let these temporary things dominate your mindset. Instead, see that your father cares for you, that you're not just a random person taking up space in the world that God created, but he loves you and he will provide for you just what you need right when you need it. And that's the hope that we can hold on to because people are going to fail us. Things are going to fail us. We're going to all face these rough situations of life that are too much for us to carry. But God teaches us here that we can trust in him because he's, he's going to be closer than the closest friend. He's the one that will never back out on us when other people do. So I just pray that this word encourages you today 
And I pray that God teaches us to trust in him, that our hope remains secure in him, that we hold fast to him, our God, who never changes, who's always the same, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he'll never stop being good. So I praise blessings over you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. The Liturgy of the Old Testament Prophecies of the Birth of Jesus. I will read the light print and you'll read the dark print. The words will be on the screen at the bottom. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Micah 5, 2. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From the roots of a branch will bear fruit.
Folks, I know that there is much to pray for. We have friends or family who are not feeling well. We have those who are in the hospital. We have those who are recovering from surgeries. We may have those who have COVID or are recovering from COVID. And there may be some that we have lost loved ones. Isaiah 7:14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. The joy of that verse tells us that God is with us in our time of prayer, in our time of despair, in our time of joy, in our time of happiness. So God is with you. Please bow your heads and hearts with me as we go to prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we talk today about Emmanuel. How so long ago you sent your one and only son to come to earth as a baby. And so, Lord, we realize that as this baby came, he grew up to be a perfect human being, the God-man that we trust, that we love, that we learn from his teaching. And so as we prepare for this Christmas season through Advent, may we recognize, may we read the scriptures, May we meditate upon who Jesus is as a young baby, as a young man, as a person willing to give his life up for the world. And so, Lord, today as we come into your presence, may you bless us and keep us through the Advent candle reading, through all the symbols, the, the hymns that we sing. May you draw close to us and we draw close to you. And we continue our time of prayer as we pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I want to continue to remind you that we very much appreciate your support of the church with your offering and your gifts. And you can give those by mailing them in, doing it online, or by direct deposit. Your continued support is still greatly appreciated and needed as we continue to provide some uh, some small amount of programming as well as paying our staff and paying our bills in the church so thank you so much for your continued support and please send those in
Pray with me, please. Loving Father, we thank you for all the blessings you provide. Help us to see you in the coming week and to share your love. Use these offerings in your service to others in need. Amen. Since the early days of the church, many believers have celebrated Advent and Christmas as two separate seasons. The first season is for preparing and expecting. At Advent, we look forward to not one, but two arrivals. First, we anticipate and long for the birth of Jesus, just as the Jewish people longed for the promised coming of the Messiah, the King who would rescue them and return glory to Israel. Christmas, the end of the Advent season, is a celebration of that promise kept the Messiah came, the Son of God sent first as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sin. But we wait still for him to come again, to return and make all things right, to take his place on the throne forever. At Advent, we prepare ourselves for that second arrival as well, with repentant hearts and joyful confidence that our God always keeps his promises. Come, our long-expected Savior. The sermon quote for today says that the magic of Christmas is not in the presence around the tree, but in God's presence surrounding us. The scripture for today is found in Micah 5.2. It says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, Though thou be little among the tribe of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth had been from old, from everlasting to everlasting. Today I want to talk to you about darkness and light. We've seen from the video an example of that. You see, there's a, a fascinating reoccurring theme in the scriptures and in the Bible that's woven through it, the theme of light and darkness. We begin with darkness only in the second verse of the Bible. Genesis 1-2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the first recorded words that God spoke in the Bible are found in Genesis 1-3, where God said, Let there be light. And there was light and the universe was created with all of the stars and the sun and the planets. 
in Genesis 1, 4 through 5, continues the same theme when it measures the reaction of God and declares, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Also in describing the coming of Jesus, the gospel writer John echoes that same theme from Genesis in the New Testament. In John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and in Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And also in Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, If therefore the light that is in you The light that is in you be darkness. How great is that darkness? And even the Apostle Paul wrote, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for the, what communion hath light with darkness? You know, I think the Bible writers were probably more conscious of the contrast between light and darkness than we are today in 2020, because their lives were governed by it so much more than ours. It's not that they were not smart enough to know the difference. I just don't think they were affected by the difference on a daily basis as we are. We have light switches that we just turn on and there's light, even in the darkness of night. I'll never forget when I was in the desert in Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Most nights, the stars were so brilliant and there were so many of them that it actually gave some light that you could see and walk around. But there were certain times where there was cloud cover at night. And when that happened in the middle of the desert, you could not see the hand in front of your face. You could wave your hand like this and just not see it because there was absolutely no light. And it was so easy to get lost without any reference forms. Jesus talks about this desert-like darkness that I experienced in John 12, 35, where it says, you are going to have the light for just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. You know something, this summer we had a terrible storm here in town in Laporte, and there was a power outage. I don't know if you remember that. It was in mid-August and um, what ended up happening is there was a tree just down the block from where I live that came in and, and ripped down the power line. And so I went and saw where that had happened and thought, well, the electric crews will get that straightened out. And so Nancy and I went home and we got the candles and flashlights ready for the evening. And so it got dark and, and so we went to bed and then got up the next morning and thought maybe that the electricity would be turned back on and it wasn't. And so we had to go through another night of darkness. And, and so there, there's other blocks around the city that had lights on, but, but we didn't. We were living in darkness and bumping into things. And so it wasn't until the next day that the power actually came on, but not before I went out and bought a generator for fear that our refrigerator and freezer would spoil everything. And so I went out and bought a, a generator, brought it home, and thought, let's plug it in. But then when I walked into the garage, all the lights were on. And so we went ahead and kept the uh, generator anyways for future uh, times. But um, we understood the difference between light and darkness. I'm convinced that we don't appreciate the contrast of light and darkness as much today, simply because we're not controlled by it as much today. But that is how the biblical writers describe the coming of Christ into the world. That is how they describe the difference that the coming of Christ would make in a person's life. It was the difference between darkness and light. It was the difference between the fear of walking into a dark room versus the confidence of hitting the light switch before you go into it. And if there's one thing that Christmas is, is the triumph of light. As we can see from the Christmas tree behind us that's lit up. As we can see from the, the candle that is lit. Light invades the darkness. John 8, 12, Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light 
of life. There was an ocean lighthouse story that I want to read to you. A friend told us that he was visiting a seashore lighthouse lately, and he said to the innkeeper, Are you not afraid to live up here in the lighthouse? It's such a dreadful place to be constantly. No, the man replied, I'm not afraid. We never think of ourselves here in the lighthouse. We only think of others. And the man says, what do you mean you never think about yourselves? How, how is that? And the reply was a good one. We know that we are perfectly safe in this big lighthouse. And we only think of having our lamps brightly burning and keeping the reflectors clear so that those in danger in the sea might be saved. Friends, that's the Christian story. That is what we are to do. We are safe in the house that Christ has built in us. And it cannot be moved by the wildest storm. And this little light in, in us that Christ holds would, should light the way for others. Did you ever notice that these big lighthouses, they have the light that goes out, but they don't have any fog horns or big noises and I think there's a lesson in there for us that as Christians, we don't need to, to run around and tell everyone that we're Christians and shout it out. We just need to live the Christian light and let our light shine before men that they may see our good deeds. Hmm. Another story. There's a mere strip of sand called Castle Island near the eastern end of the Bahamas. A few people are aware of it. And as a tiny isolated island as it is, there's a lighthouse that is its protector for those out to sea. One day, a young man was sailing in the area. He anchored his sailboat off on the lighthouse and swam to shore to exercise his legs on the beach. The lighthouse keeper was surprised and delighted to have the company, and he invited the young man to join him for some fresh caught lobster and a tour of the lighthouse. The young man climbed a winding staircase to the lantern room in the top of the stairs, and he was astonished at the size of the light that signaled safe passage through the maze of reefs. The light was just only a tiny kerosene flame, barely bright enough to read by it. Yet with the aid of mirrors and reflectors, it was visible for 25 miles out to sea. There's a lesson in here for us. Jesus, the Christ, had told us to let our light shine. But tell me, what if your light is a very dim one? What if our good works are few and small? I believe that our little light is magnified in the immense mirror of the almighty God of love. I believe that God's reflectors are human hearts spreading the flame of kindness to one, each other, one another this Christmas season. The story of Castle Island reminds each and every one of us that even the most insignificant action or deed on our part, such as giving up our place in the grocery store, checkout line to a mother with a fretful baby or a short two line written note to a neighbor's mailbox or a smile and a hello to someone. Even such faint candles in our hearts can be multiplied by Almighty God to shine like beacons in a dark world. Isaiah 9 2 says this, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. That was the promise, folks, of John 8, 12, where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the light comes in to invade the darkness. The light comes in to be our little light in this world that we may be the light of Christ. In closing, I leave you with a beautiful picture of the Buffalo Lighthouse at the mouth of Lake Erie Basin. They were repairing the lighthouse, and when the light was not working, they decided to put up a brightly lit Christmas tree to direct the ships into the harbor. What an excellent symbol of the light of Jesus saving his people. 
Church family, during this Advent season, may we search for the light of Christ in a world of darkness. May we be the light in a dark world. May the Lord bless and keep you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we begin this Advent season, allow us to see the light as the light of the world. And may we take that light upon us and be a light in the darkness of our own world. Lord, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. May the Lord bless and keep you. God bless. Church family at home, wherever you are, in whatever city, whatever state, or around the world, we give the benediction and God's blessing to you, wherever you are. May the light of God light your path. May the love of God rule in your hearts. And may the peace of God live out in your actions. And may God bless us all until we meet again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you this day of Sabbath. Thank you.
confess you Jesus 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 nothing else